Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala wa ba'an. So it pleases us to welcome you all to Masjid al Dawil al Tawheed in the city of Baltimore uh, for this one day event regarding some very important uh, subjects and topics that are plaguing and affecting the Muslims today. My topic, Bithin Allah Ta'ala, I'm going to be speaking about uh, drugs and alcohol, their usage and the effects which they have upon the individual, upon the mind and the religion of the individual. As we know, our religion, it is set up in such a way that it safeguards five essential matters. And those five essential matters are a dam, meaning the blood or the person of the individual. Likewise, al-aql, the intellect or the mind of the individual. Likewise, al-ird, the honor. It has also been articulated as a nasal or one's lineage, as well as al-mal, one's wealth, and fifthly, a deen the religion of the person. So this affair that we're going to speak about, Bidhanullah Ta'ala, it is something which affects and harms not just one, not a few, but each and every one of these five matters. And that is the affair, as you mentioned, of drugs and alcohol. And more precisely, we should say intoxicants, generally speaking, as we're going to see, inshallah ta'ala. So the permanent committee, in Lajna Adaima, defined khamar, they said, quoting from Ibn Faris in his Mu'jam, his dictionary, known as Maqais al lugha he said, it consists of the letters Kha, Meem, Ra, or Khamara. And it is Aslun Wahid, Yadulu ala at Taghtiyati, wa Mukhalita, fi Satr. It is a word, when it, these letters are brought together, it indicates the covering up and the clouding and covering of something. So al-khamar, it is extracted from a word that means to cover something up. Due to the fact that khamar, it covers up and it clouds one's mind or one's intellect. Derived from this word is the khimar that Muslim women wear because it covers up their head. Similarly, al-khumra, a khumra is yani something that's placed upon the ground for you to prostrate upon. It's called a khumra because it covers up the area which you're going to prostrate upon. Like this, al khamar, yani it clouds and it covers up one's intellect. This is its linguistic meaning. As for its legislative meaning, then khamar is everything that uh, befogs and clouds one's mind and covers it up. So therefore, the individual who utilizes khamar then they are not able to distinguish between what is beneficial and what is harmful. Similarly, they are not able to distinguish from that which is good or that which is detrimental. It has come on the authority of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma that he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said kullu muskir and khamr that everything that intoxicates Everything that intoxicates is khamar. Well, kullu muskir and haram. And everything that intoxicates is haram. Everything that intoxicates, whether it is alcohol or something else, some other substance, all of that is considered to be khamar. And every intoxicant is haram. Women sharib al khamr fi dunya fa huwa yudminuha. So therefore, whoever consumes intoxicants in this dunya, and he dies being addicted to that or doing that habitually, lam yatub, not repenting from that, he will not drink from the khamar in the hereafter. Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, he said, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ijtanibu al-khamar fa'innaha miftah kulli sharr. He said, alayhi wa sallatu salam, avoid khamar. For indeed, it is the key, it is the miftah to every evil. And what does a key do? A key does what? It opens what? Doors. It opens doors. 
So, so like this, we see, and we're going to see in that which is the come, in the Ta'ala, that the affair of intoxicants opens doors to many evils. This is as it relates to the definition of intoxicants, or khamr. As for the definition, and it's the next point, of addiction. The definition of addiction. Then the scientific term for addiction is dependence. And dependence, it is of two types. Dependence is of two types. Firstly, there is psychological dependence. Secondly, physical dependence. Psychological dependence and physical dependence. As for a psychological dependence, then this is the personal tendency compelling the addict towards his preferred substance or narcotic such that it leads to psychological conditions and at times it becomes physical resulting from using the narcotic substance at a level which makes the addict inclined towards increasing the dosage. You find that over time a person they may start off it only takes a little bit to get them where they need to be. But over time, yani, their tolerance increases. And it takes more and more. So they have to do what? They have to increase the dosage in order to get them the feeling that they're chasing. Now, this is what it's referred to as one's tolerance or their sensitivity level. A compelling yearning controls the addict, driving him to strive to attain the desired psychological substance through any means possible and in any way under any circumstance from that which will bring it about by way of abnormal actions. This is why we find that the people they will do things that any sane, sober, moral, prudent person will not do in order to attain what? The substance which they desire. You find women oftentimes selling their bodies for small trivial amounts of money chasing after the substance as for physical dependence this is the state which the addict is in when he ceases being addicted to the narcotic and it is a combination of symptoms which come about as the result of a body's of the body's attempt to rid itself of the effects of the toxins of that narcotic we call it, in Baltimore, they used to call it being ill, right? When a person is going through that state wherein the body is trying to rid itself of those toxins, they get sick. They get sick. Now, and so these symptoms are the most severe as it relates to opium and anything that is derived from opium, such as what? Heroin. heroin. Such as heroin. And this is since its time period lasts normally between two and four days, and, it's, and at times it can result in death. A person can die while their body is trying to rid itself of those toxins. As for the harms of drugs and alcohol and toxicants in general, then its harms are well known. And some of the harms, they come about to a person's uh, body, to a person's mind, their health in general, and to their deen. From the harms of intoxicants is the habil aql, is that it causes a person to lose their mind. It causes a person's intellect to go. And the intellect is that which separates and distinguishes us from the animals. The fact that we have intellect. Patada, he said, rahmatullah alayhi, خلق الله سبحانه الملائكة عقولا بلا شهوات. The Allah Taala He created the angels with intellects but no desires. وخلق البهائم شهوات بلا عقول. He created the animals with desires but no intellect. وخلق الإنسان وجعل له عقلا وشهوة. He created the human being. He gave him both intellect and desires. So therefore, he whose intellect overpowers his desires, then he is along with the malaika. He's along with the angels. And he whose desires overpower his intellect, 
فَهُوَ كَلْبَهَائِمْ He's like an animal. He's like an animal. And Ibn Taymiyyah alayhi rahmatullah, he went further to say that rather the animals are better than him. Anyone whose intellect is overpowered by their desire, then the animals are khairun minhu. They are better than him. It comes inside of Majmu'a Fatawa that he alayhi rahmatullah, Ibn Taymiyyah, he mentions that the strength of the human being is from two angles. The power and strength of a human being is from, excuse me, three angles. It's from three angles. Firstly, the angle of the intellect, the mind. Secondly, the angle of strength and power in his body. Thirdly, strength and power in his sexually. Strength and power sexually. The highest of these three is which? The intellect. The highest of these three is the intellect. And this is that which the human has been specified with over the other mammals. And the angels share with, with him in that, meaning angels likewise have intellect. And he went on to say that after strength in one's mind and, and intellect, the next most beneficial is strength in one's body, by way of which he's able to repel harm from himself. You're able to defend yourself because you've been given strength in your body. You can ward off harm from yourself in the likes of this. And then thirdly comes the sexual strength, by way of which other benefits are brought about. The bringing about of lineage, the perpetuity of mankind, and so on and so forth. He says, so therefore whoever's mind, his intellect, overpowers his shahwa, for who khairun min malaika, then he is greater and better than the angels. And he whose shahwa, his desires, overpowers his mind and his intellect, minhu, then the animals are better than him. The animals are better than him. End of his speech, rahmatullah alayhi. From that which indicates yani, this particular affair, this point that we mentioned, how one, when one begins to use yani, intoxicants, their mind just leaves them. Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih, what they mean, he said, Rasulullah. The Messenger of Allah has spoken the truth, meaning in that which he mentioned previously. From the hadith that we said, that yani, that uh, yani, khamar, yani, is the miftah to every sharr, it is the key to every evil. He said, that which the Messenger of Allah said, alayhi aslam, is truthful. فَإِنَّ الْخَمَرْ مِفْتَاحْ كُلِّ شَرٍ He says, because khamar is the key to every evil. And it brings together every sin. For the one who utilizes it, then he loses his mind. And he is placed alongside the majaneen, alongside the insane people. It's as though he's insane. And perhaps he will kill himself and not even perceive that. And perhaps yazni bi ibnatihi, perhaps he will fornicate with his daughter or fornicate with his own mother and not even perceive any of that. Is this far-fetched? It's not far-fetched. It's an individual named Alexander McDonald, 27 years old, described as otherwise being a very well-mannered and laid-back individual. Came into his house one day high on cocaine, raped his mother at knife point, and then murdered her, and then took her car and crashed their car. When the police caught up with him, they yeah, went back to the home, found his mother dead. He didn't realize any of that. He didn't know any of that. He didn't know anything that occurred. This is what it does. That, these things can occur and a person won't even realize it. Now, and it will cause him to transgress against others while he is unaware. What indicates this is what is reported by Al-Bayhaqi with an authentic chain of narration from Uthman ibn Affan that he said He said avoid intoxicants for this is the mother of all evil There was a man amongst those who passed away before you He used to worship Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala, he was a worshipper and he withdrew from the people. فَحَبَّتْهُ imra'atun. A woman fell in love with him. A woman fell in love with him. And so 
she sent her slave girl to him to summon him, to call him, to bear witness over a contract. And so he came to the house to witness this contract. And when he entered along with the slave girl, every doorway he passed by, she locked the door behind him. Until he came to the last doorway, and there he saw a woman who was beautiful. She was sitting there along with a small boy and a cup of alcohol. She said to him, in reality, I did not call you here to witness any contract. Rather, I called you here to give you this ultimatum. Either you can drink this alcohol, kill this child, or have relations with me. You can drink the alcohol, kill this child, or have relations with me. And so when the man saw that, that he had no choice but to do one of these three, he examined them, and he found the alcohol to be the lightest of them, so he drank the alcohol. And when he got drunk, he, he slept with the woman and he killed the boy, committing all three. From the evils of intoxicants is that it gives shaitan mastery over the individual. It gives shaitan mastery over the individual who consumed the intoxicant. And shaitan, as you know, is your enemy. And once your enemy gains mastery over you, what do you think he's going to do with you? He's not going to take it light. Allah Ta'ala mentioned within his book, Istahwada alayhim al-shaytan fa'ansahum dhikrullah That shaitan gained control and mastery over them. And thus made them to forget the remembrance of Allah Ta'ala wa ta'ala, ula'ika hizb al-shaytan. They are the party of shaytan, ala inna hizb al-shaytani hum al-khasirun. Indeed, the Hizb and the party of Shaitan, they are the losers. Likewise, from its evils, is that it will, for the individual who consumes intoxicants in any form, it will be a means of blocking entrance for them into the paradise of Allah Taala. Ta and that blockage is either a permanent blockage or yani, it is a temporary blockage yani, if the person is a Muslim and thus the end result will be the paradise of Allah Taala, wa ta unless it be that Allah Ta'ala pardons them and overlooks completely. What proves this is the statement of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam and that which has come on the authority of Abu Musa the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said Thalatha la yadkhulun al-jannah There are three that will not enter into the paradise. Mudman al khamar the one who uses intoxicants habitually. Waqati al rahim secondly, the one who cuts the ties of the womb. Thirdly, musdiq bisihr, the one who engages in sihr or magic. And whoever dies while being addicted, habitually using intoxicants. Allah Ta'ala will make him to drink from the river of Al-Ghuta. The companion said, and what is this river of Al-Ghuta? He said, Nahrun Yajri bin Furuj al Mumisat. It is a river that flows from the private parts of the prostitutes of the hellfire. The smell, the stench of their private parts harms the people of the hellfire. It's hadith, if you put it authentic by a dhahabi. May Allah protect us. Likewise, from its harms is that the one who habitually uses intoxicants is similar to the worshiper of an idol. He's made and considered to be similar to the worshiper of an idol. This is due to what has come on the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that he said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Mudman al khamar ka'abid wafin, that the one who habitually uses intoxicants is like the worshipper of an idol. As Cindy, he explained this narration within his explanation of Ibn Majah. 
He said that his statement, Mudmin al Khamar, I meaning the one who uses Khamar habitually, always returning back to it, utilizing it frequently. And the meaning of his statement, Ka'abid Wathan, that he's similar to the worshiper of an idol, he said this is because Allah wa Ta'ala has combined between the cons consumption of intoxicants and the worship of idols within one verse. He brought them together in one verse. That is the statement of Allah Ta'ala. Ya ayuha ladina amunu, inna mal khamru wal maysiru wal ansabu wal azlamu rijsun min amal al shaytan. Which tanibu la alakum to free home. Allah Ta'ala said, O you who believe, indeed khamar, intoxicants, gambling, and altars upon which animals are sacrificed for other than Allah Ta'ala. And likewise, divining arrows. These are all filth from the handiworks of shaitan. So avoid them for that perhaps you will be successful. Similarly, as Cindy says, what makes them similar to the worshiper of an idol is the fact that if a person worships idols, if they are a person of shirk, Allah Ta'ala will not accept their ibadah. Likewise, the one who consumes intoxicants, his prayer is not acceptable by Allah Ta'ala. And this brings us to the next point, that the one who consumes intoxicants, his prayer will not be accepted by Allah for a period of 40 days. And this does not mean that he does not have to pray. Rather, he still has to pray. He's still obliged to pray. But he will not attain a reward for that prayer for a period of 40 days. This is due to what has come on the authority Abdullah ibn Umar. That he said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man sharib al khamr, lam yaqbil Allah lahu salatan arba'ina sabahan. That whoever consumes intoxicants, whoever gets drunk, whoever smokes something he should not smoke, whoever snorts something he should not snort, whoever shoots up something he should not shoot up, whoever consumes or pops a pill that he should not pop. Because all of it enters into the use of intoxicants. Whoever does that, Allah Ta'ala will not accept his prayer for 40 days. But if he repents, Allah will accept his repentance. And if he re returns back to it again, Allah will not accept his prayer for 40 days. But if he repents, Allah will accept his repentance. And if he returns back to it again, Allah will not accept his prayer for 40 days. If he repents, Allah will accept his repentance. But if he returns to it a fourth time, Allah will not accept his prayer for 40 days. And if he repents, Allah will not accept his repentance. And he will make him to drink from the river of Khabal. And it was said, O oh, oh, Abu Abdul Rahman, who was the narrator, what is this river of Al Khabal? He said, Nahrum min Sadid Ahl Nar. He said, It is a river made of the pus of the people of the hellfire. <laughs> Likewise, from its harms, is that the one who utilizes that, he is a burden. They are a burden. He's a burden upon his community. A burden upon his family, a burden upon the masjid, <coughs> even a burden upon himself. Think about one who you know who utilizes these matters. They come to the masjid, they stink. They stink. Emanate, a horrible smell emanating from them. And due to the fact that they're high, they don't think anybody smells it. They don't think anybody notices it. That's the proof that you're high. You don't think we know that you're high. They're a burden upon the people. A burden upon themselves, a burden upon their family. Hate to see him coming. Don't know what type of fitness he's going to bring with him. Likewise, from the harms of intoxicants is that it brings about for the person the la'na and the curse of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And it's due to what has come on the authority of Anas ibn Malik That he said La'anna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Fil Khamr Ashra That the Messenger of Allah Alaihi Wasallam 
as it relates to khamar, cursed ten categories or classes of people. Asiruha, he cursed. And the meaning of curse is what? Who knows the meaning of al-la'na? Nah, they are, this person is expelled and far removed from the mercy of Allah Taala. That he cursed, invoke curses upon ten. The one who presses it, the one from whom it is pressed, the one who drinks it, the one who carries it, the one to whom it is carried. Delivery men, pay attention. Pay attention to what you're delivering. The one who carries it and the one to whom it is carried. The one who pours it, the one who sells it, <coughs> the one who consumes its price, and the one who purchases it, and the one for whom it is purchased. All of these classes and categories of people cursed by the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tanbih. So what is the ruling, therefore, of selling intoxicants? Because some of the people, they take the affair of selling it lightly. They say, I'm not utilizing it, I'm not using it, but I have a store, and in my store I have beer, and I have all types of alcohol, and alcoholic substances, and so on and so forth in my store. What is the ruling of this? We know that the, the one who does so, based upon the narration that we heard, is subjected to the curse of the Messenger of Allah Alayhi wa sallam. So this shows and lets us know, one, that it is haram, two, that it is a kabir al kabat al dhunub It's a major sin. It is a major sin. Because the major sin has been defined, ayyul ikhwa, as that sin which has a prescribed punishment in this life connected to it, a curse is mentioned in connection with it, the rendering of a person's actions null and void. Likewise, the, uh, the mention of the hellfire. All of these fair, uh, affairs are from the definitions of a kabira. The mention of Allah alayhi said, and what has come on the authority of Abu Huraira, Yati ala nas zaman la yubal mar ma akhada minhu, that a time will come upon the people wherein a man will not care where he earns his living at, from the halal or from the haram. He won't even care. Ahmed ibn Muhammad, known as Al Haytami, he has a book, Tuhfa Al Muhtaj fi Shah Al Minhaj. He said that Al Ras wal Waj Ashraf ma fil Badan that the head and the face are the most noble parts of the body. One's head and one's face are the most noble parts of the body. Due to this, we find that the closest that you are to Allah wa Taala is what? When you put these portion of your body on the ground, your head and your face, closer you are to your Lord. It's the most noble parts of the body. So it's from the ajaib that a person goes to great lengths to preserve and safeguard what he puts into his stomach. They want to read a bag of Skittles before they eat it. They want to be careful about their diet and what they put into their body, into their stomach. They will allow drugs to enter into their mind. They will allow alcohol to enter into their mind. This is from the Hajjah, some amazing affair. As for some of the harms which these affairs have, upon one's body, the use of drugs and alcohol. We'll just speak about some of that which is prevalent amongst the youth today. And some of the effects which uh, the medical specialists have mentioned that they have. This affair of uh, perks, Percocets. A lot of the youth, they are, uh, I mean, they are utilizing this affair, these Percocets. From that which they bring about, <coughs> nausea, vomiting, constipation, lightheadedness, dizziness, drowsiness, itching, nodding, slurred speech, aggressiveness, especially towards women and children, delayed reactions. This is the symptoms of a Percocet user. This oxycodone. They say oxycodone here. Oxycodone, nausea, vomiting, constipation, dry mouth, weakness in one's body, sweating, lightheadedness, 
dizziness, promethazine, drowsiness, headaches, nightmares, the feeling of dizziness, restlessness, a feeling of confusion, cocaine, violence, it makes the user violent, nervousness, psychotic behavior, hallucinations, confusion, anxiety, sadness, loss of appetite. We see cocaine users, they're typically skinny, not because they're not eating, or not, rather not because of the drug itself, because they're not eating, they don't even have an appetite to eat. They're chasing the drug. Now, mental instability, the loss of the ties of friendships and family. And the affair of codeine, the list was too long to even mention. This syrup that many of the youth are engaging in, drinking the syrup, right? It's cough syrup, codeine. The list was too long to mention from, the, from some of the affairs that we heard, some of the affairs that we have not mentioned. From that which we likewise want to tie to the subject and mention the connection with it, which many of the people are tried with using today, is cigarettes. The smoking of cigarettes. And this, Ayolekwa, many of the people are tried with the use of cigarettes today. Tobacco. And the stuff that they're putting in it is not like you're smoking the stuff that the Indians smoke. The straight tobacco. They, they put so much chemicals, so many chemicals into it. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And they tell you right there on a the pack it could possibly kill you and cause you cancer. Yet the people, they use it anyway. They use it anyway. So many of the people, both males and females, they are tried with the use of this. As for its harms, there are many. Amongst the harms of cigarettes, you, some of them are religious harms, such as it makes a person I mean, hate gatherings of virtue and stay away from them because they cannot be patient with sitting through any long class and the likes of it, they need to go. They gotta go. Because what? They wanna smoke. They wanna smoke. So they can't be patient with sitting for long periods of time because they're addicted to cigarettes. Mom, likewise, as it relates to uh, the Jumu'ah prayers, sitting in the masjid around the people and the likes of this, they can't be patient with the likes of that except for a short period of time before they need to leave before they need to leave. And all of that is an indication and proof of its filth. Likewise, it makes the affair of fasting difficult for the smoker. Fa especially when the fasting days are long. It makes it difficult for them. And they can't wait until the day is over. They begin to be irritated. They can't wait till the day is over so they can do what? Rush of their pack of cigarettes. Likewise, when a person spends their money and their wealth on cigarettes, this is considered by the legislation to be israf and wasting wealth and spending wealth frivolously. And Allah Ta'ala mentioned within his book, Wala tubdir tabdiran inna al mubadhirina kanu ikhwana shayateen. And do not uh, be extravagant in the way that you spend wealth. Don't be wasteful in the way that you spend wealth. Indeed, those who are wasteful in the way that they spend wealth are brothers of the shayateen. Likewise, you'll find that cigarettes is considered to be from the generality of mukhadirat, from the generality of drugs in reality that those who are cognizant and aware and are exp experienced in the field of medicine and the likes of this have attested to due to what it contains inside of it. As you mentioned, all right, it's not just tobacco. It's not just tobacco. Don't think you're like some Native American that you're just smoking straight tobacco. Rather, they have nicotine in it. And it's nicotine, Ayolikwa, it's been mentioned that it is more harmful than arsenic. It is more harmful than arsenic. Thousands of times more harmful than arsenic. 
And Sheikh Zayed al Malkhali mentioned that the doctors have stated that if one drop of nicotine is placed on the skin of a rabbit, it will kill the rabbit. It will kill the rabbit. You put this in your lungs. If two drops are placed upon the tongue of a cat, it will kill the cat. If five drops of nicotine are placed on the tongue of a camel, it will kill the camel instantly. These are some of the harms of cigarette use. As for the harms to one's wealth, ask anyone who smokes cigarettes habitually how much they spend a year on cigarettes. How much are cigarettes costing these days? A pack. Don't tell me. <laughs> thousands of dollars a year. Thousands of dollars a year wasted on cigarettes. Sheikh Zaidi mentions that from that which is known is that Islam commands with the safeguarding and preservation of one's wealth and commands with spending wealth in permissible ways and it prohibits the wasting of one's wealth and without doubt the one who, sends their wealth, who spends their wealth upon cigarettes then and their likes and they are wasting their wealth and what they have spent is considered to be from that which is haram and wasteful and sufficient is that in terms of sin and transgression and loss and the wasting of wealth that Allah Taala has prohibited or this is the wasting of wealth that Allah Taala has prohibited so what do you think if wasting wealth generally speaking is haram just wasting your wealth is haram what do you think about the one that wastes their wealth as a retarded person would do by setting it on fire if we had a pile of money right here we just okay we're just going to set the money on fire if we ask you for donations and you give all your money and we set the donations on fire you'd be highly upset similarly the smoker this is exactly what he's doing wasting his wealth by burning it and not just that harming himself in the process harming himself or herself in the process possibly bringing about sicknesses and diseases, lung cancer, throat cancer, mouth cancer, and other types of illnesses that come about as a result of that. Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Ubaz, he was asked the following question. He was asked that a hadith has come an authentic narration has come prohibiting coming close to the masjid or approaching the masjid for one who has eaten garlic or onions. So does the one who has a repugnant odor and smell upon him, such as the smell of cigarettes, enter into this ruling. Sheikh Abdulaziz ibn Abbas said in response, it is affirmed from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he said, whoever eats onions and garlic is not to come close to our masjid, not to come near our masjid, and let him pray inside of his house. This is affirmed from him, alayhi salam. And he likewise said, Inna al-malaika tata'adha mimma yata'adha minhu banu insan, that the angels are harmed and offended by the same things that harm and offend Mankind, someone is around you and they smell repugnant, they have a repugnant odor emanating from them, you're annoyed by that, you want to move away from them. The angels are offended by the same thing that humans are offended by. He said, alayhi rahmatullah, wa kul ma lahu ra'iha kariha, everything that has a foul odor, then its ruling is the same as that of onions and garlic, such as the one who smokes cigarettes. And the one who has upon himself a horrible odor in his armpits, or other than that. And he harms those who are sitting next to him by way of his odor when he prays and the likes of that. He says, so therefore, he should stay away until he utilizes something that will remove that odor from him. It is obligatory upon him to do so. 
it is obligatory upon him to do so if he is capable of doing that. In order that he may uh, uh, perform that which Allah Ta'ala has made obligatory upon him from the, from the prayer in Jama'ah. Meaning he removes the, the odor from himself. And don't just try to cover it up with some oil. You, you walk around smell like oil in Newports. <laughs> Rather, you really have to remove this odor from yourself. It's harmful. He said, alayhi rahmatullah, in order that he may perform his obligations, such as the prayer in Jama'ah. As for tadkhin, as for smoking, muhalla, it is unrestrictedly impermissible. Some of the people, they try to say, okay, it's just disliked. There were no cigarettes during the time of the Masjid of Allah, alayhi salam, and like this. Naam, Sheikh bin Baz, he said, it's muharram mutlaqan. It is unrestrictedly haram. Unrestrictedly haram. Wayyajib alayhi tarkuhu. It is obligatory upon him to abandon it in all circumstances due to what it contains from harms upon the deen, upon the body, and upon the wealth. And may Allah Ta'ala rectify the affairs of the Muslims and grant them success to every good. The last point that we want to mention is that of istihlal al-khamr. You find some people making khamr halal. And how are they doing this? How are they making the khamr halal? Is it that they're saying that khamr is permissible in our religion? The Messenger of Allah alayhi salam, he said in what has come on the authority of Ubad ibn al-Samit Qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam A group amongst my ummah They're going to make khamar halal Bismin yusammunaha By way of another name that they're going to give it They call it by way of other than its actual name So they call it, you know, whatever they want to call it they assign other names to it, spirits and the likes of that. Just, you know, getting a little tipsy, getting a little nice, or whatever they want to call it, name it. We're, we're not concerned with the names, Ayyulaqwa. The names don't concern us. What concerns us is the reality. And the Messenger of Allah said, alayhi salam, that every intoxicant, kullu muskur and khamar, every intoxicant, everything that intoxicates is khamar. And every khamar is haram. Every khamar is haram. But for the one that has been tried with the usage of intoxicants, we say that the door to Tawbah is wide open for you. The door to repentance is wide open for you. As the Messenger of Allah said, alayhi salam, that hijrah is not discontinued until Tawbah is discontinued. And Tawbah is not discontinued until the sun rises from its place of setting. The door to Tawbah is wide open for you. And if you repent, Allah Ta'ala, he will accept your repentance. If you've been tried with something from the use of intoxicants and the likes of this, then do what you have to do to get help. There's nothing wrong with that, Ayyul Akhwa. There's nothing wrong with seeking professional help if this is what you need to do. <coughs> so do whatever you need to do, and may Allah Ta'ala uh, protect the Muslims and safeguard the Muslims from these evils. Uh, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik. Ala nabiyyina Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أخير دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام 